Hi, this is Chris with Clever Unicorn Games and the Unicorn Collective back with another interview. Today I have designer and publisher Matt Aslan with me. How are you doing today, Matt? Very well. So, Matt, tell me, when you are not designing or playing games, what is it you like to do with your spare time? Remember back to a time before you had this Kickstarter. What did you like to do with your spare time? <laughs> spare time? Yeah. Uh, no, I've, I've been a gamer all my life, so gaming is what I do day in, day out. Like Whether it's you know collecting painting miniatures or pulling games apart and finding out how they work or just playing games with my family. Like, I just to really enjoy it what would you say is your favorite board game uh i'm definitely a kingdom death fanboy <laughs> so kingdom death is your favorite game yeah definitely enjoy a good twisted universe that's as hard as hell <laughs> yeah yet to play it yet i mean like i was saying to you beforehand i really want to get my hands on some of those miniatures and get them painted up especially that big dragon big dragon looks cool oh it's stunning Oh, and the thing with the baby face as well. Oh, uh, Gorm. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Baby Rhino. What kinds of games or genres of games inspired you to start creating games? Um, well, see, I'm a tabletop war gamer for many, many moments. I, I do like the diversity that those sort of games bring and the way that they can grow over time you get new editions of them and new mechanics are brought in but it's still at the core of the same game i guess it's a little bit different to board games where you get one shot at it and the second edition will be slight tweaks and tidy up to the rule book it won't be a, as, as much as an evolution as you get in the the war gaming side of things so i think that's where it sort of started originally and my love for dice i'd like games with dice some would say that as a war gamer, dice should be something you shy away from now due to their fickleness. Hello. Dice dice make excitement. Like everyone tells a story about when a dice went one way or another. Like a whole plan, a whole strategy either came to fruition or it fell into a burning heap because a dice went one way or another. And those are stories you will tell forever. Well <laughs> they yeah, are worth there's, plastic cubes <laughs> there's one i remember where a dice just hit the table right and it was a flat piece of table but it actually stood on its edge that was the time that i remember the dice. yeah actually went on the corner of itself so it was it was yep. balanced i was like how was that because we looked around and we looked at it and it was stuck there and we couldn't see how it was it just it just could, shouldn't have happened yep <laughs> and that's what i remember i mean you had to re-roll it because it was caught but yeah <laughs> the dice gods are undecided <laughs> When coming up with a game um, and you've got the idea in your head, where do you start first? Uh, I'm a theme first person. I'm one of those people. Um, the game has to have the flavor. Like I want to, I don't really want to feel like I'm doing whatever the the theme is. I don't want to just be grinding and pushing cubes, and it just happens to be this theme or that theme. I find that it sort of locks locks me down too much when I think more mechanically behind it i like to think okay this is what i want to do i want to you know skydive okay what can i do that will make a player feel like they're skydiving like, you know. you've now taken your game uh, from your head pretty much you've you've successfully funded and now you're going to produce the game what one or two hurdles or barriers have you hit during that time where you've been stumped and been like oh man how am i going to get past this and then how did you overcome those barriers? I think one of the biggest ones is regarding the actual funding and the numbers behind the game. So actually sitting there and going, oh man, to actually make this game a, a viable product is it isn't just, oh, let's go to Kickstarter and see how we go. It's sitting down and crunching the numbers and going, okay, this game isn't viable until we make 1,500 units of it. And taking that as a realization and going, that's the new target. It isn't, we're going to make $50 or $50,000. We've got to sell 1,500 units of this game to make it worthwhile. So how are we going to do that? Like that becomes work backwards from there. And that's what we did. We sat down, broke that down as the maths. It wasn't, yeah, a dollar of value then. It was sell 1,500 units. If it took it one by one, step by step, get those 1,500 units done. The money will just come because of that. 
Yeah, no, that, that, that is really good. And especially now when you hear, spoke to many people at, at shows and, and through these things, and now if you want to be taken seriously after a Kickstarter, I think that the number now is if you can sell 1,500 units in Kickstarter, you're much more likely to be able to get distribution and retail afterwards. If you I get... think the number's a little bit higher now even. Oh, it's good because this was a year ago that I got this. Has it gone up again now? Yeah, no, it's looking more like the three to five now. Three to five thousand. It's there's so many things that aren't viable below that that people get mistaken. Uh, plastics are a big one, like paint molds and injected molding. Like yes, the molds only a thousand bucks or twelve hundred bucks or whatever it costs. You have to work that into every single unit of your your model. So. Is it worth it at that stage? And it really isn't until you can knock it under that dollar per unit. You start adding a dollar to units, that's $5 at retail that you've just added to the product for that one thing. So that one thing bloody be <laughs> And a lot of the time it's not, it's a custom dice or some other superfluous first player token or something like that. It's not a key component. If your key components cost you that much, you go, oh, cool. That's what it has to be to to play the game, and that that's one of the real selling points that I'm gonna be able to push forward. But when it's not, I I do not know why people do it all the time. It baffles me. It's a really uh, unneeded, unnecessary cost. Have you ever played a game, and you don't have to name it, um, that you just didn't like at all? And what was it? Was it a theme or a mechanic? What was it that you didn't like that put you off the game? I find I struggle with a few mechanics and I think it's because I'm a, a war gamer at heart. So I find a lot of light games a little bit dull and it's, uh, there's light games in my collection that I, I love, but for the most part, as soon as I hear things like card drafting and, Oh, this game's, you know, this little game with, you know, only a few cards that plays in like 10, 15 minutes. I sit, I sit down game. I want more meat. Uh, it might be just because I love theme as well. I love being immersed into a universe and leaving the real world behind for, you know, half an hour or four hours or whatever the game length is. And, you know, and when a game can't do that and when I could just sit there going, man, I could slap any theme on this game and I would do the exact same thing, I just I, I find, find it lacklustered. Why is it that you want to make games? What is it that you want to do with your gaming empire? Uh, world domination is the first step, of course. And then once Next you're on the <laughs> Well, we've got a game uh, that I co designed with someone that's called uh, Spy Goons. It's currently slated to be our third game, though it might go with another publisher rather than us. But yeah, you play as the little minions behind a, an evil mastermind who's trying to either destroy the world or take over the world. <laughs> They're not little yellow minions, are they? With blue over. No, or... they're very cool. We call we call them goons, and they're hilarious. They because unlike minions that never die, goons die and just get replaced. They don't even have names; they just have numbers. <laughs> Man, that sounds incredible. Yeah, they get they die left, right, and center. They they it's a worker placement, but your workers are actually a resource as well. <laughs> so you can get more of them and lose them, and yeah, they just come, they just pop out of nowhere, sort of thing. Just boop. More, 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 more. And then some of them get run over by steamrollers like in Austin Powers yeah, and stuff they, like that. You know, whack machines malfunction and explode and you go, oh, well, if you die, you know, international spy turns up, shoots up a room of them, and you're like, oh, well. <laughs> Let's hire <laughs> <Get> more. <laughs> yep. <laughs> how has the state of the world at present affected how you are designing uh, games? I don't know if it affects so much the design of the game. It's definitely affecting the next stages after, I guess, the design. It's putting the businessman hat on and the, the marketing side of things. Uh, it's definitely a different world. Um, even just choosing to run, we ran, uh, I ran the Rat Catcher Kickstarter during the COVID break through May to early June. Um, and it was a choice I made because COVID was around and the, um as a solo game it was something that would be on people's minds um we were seeing a real dip in competition so we were, i think at this stage we were at 30 percent less projects to compete against and as silly as it sounded it was just it was good business sense to run 
uh, rat catcher then, and it proved really well to us with two and a half thousand backers. So. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had had a solo game ready to go. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of a morbid thought, really, but yeah, it, it was the perfect time to launch solo and even two player games. Two player games would do well as well because so many people. Yeah, with I was surprised else. there wasn't two pl- light two player games. Would have done really well too. Yeah, but you just unfortunately and unfortunately you just don't see these things coming. It's one of those things. A game's not something. Yeah, you, you can design for a trend. Uh, it was. I have like Wreckage is not new. Wreckage is a year and a half, two years of development. Like it's, it, it just happened or come out at the right time and solos were hot, which I, I'm not definitely complaining about. So. Apart from uh, Rat Catchers, what else are you working on right now? Anything apart from your Minions game as well? Yeah, so uh, Spy Goons is on the list, but the next game is actually something that, again, we haven't seen around. So uh, we're doing Aussie Horror next time with a game called Drop Bears. And I haven't seen a horror game do this before where the characters are unarmed. You know, all you see zombie movies and everything else, everyone's got shotguns and knives and axes and everything like that. Um, for me, the description I was always told of the difference between a thriller movie and a horror movie is whether the gun has bullets in it. And for me, a true horror is you run. You run and hope you survive. Um, so that's what this game's all about. You play against one of Australia's favourite myths to tell our local tourists when they come and visit us is that the deadly koalas that eat people's faces off, the bears. So you will uh, be running for your lives through the Australian bush, eating Vegemite and <laughs> running from the drop bears. I think I have one of them. Ah, he's one of the huge meeple prototypes that I can find in Sergeant Oh, yeah, that's, that's horrifying. <laughs> no, that looks very interesting. And yeah, yeah, that's perfect because yeah, horror movies traditionally were somebody or people getting picked off who were helpless. You know, they were helpless. Yeah. They, they, the only thing to do was run. There was no guns and things. Yeah. Well, that's why the first Aliens movie was the best of all of them. Exactly. And it only took one alien. Like that. That's the thrill of it all. It's the simplicity. And it and was yeah, hiding. Were... Yeah, and it was hiding and didn't show itself all the time. And I think that's what's missing in, in it was the, current it was trend. The scary shadow. Yeah, it's funny it though. It's funny when you look back at those seen. movies. It's funny when you look back at those movies like Alien and Jaws. It's like, oh yeah, they were more more suspenseful, and yeah, you didn't see the creature a lot of the time. It's because the creature either didn't look great if you looked at it too long, or didn't work properly, like in Jaws. But it was yes. really expensive. <laughs> but it worked. That's the thing. Nowadays, yeah. with CGI and, and, and coming so far, you just see everything. The monster's in five seconds, you're like, eh, he's not that scary. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, an, uh, it's a human mentality. We're, we're generally scared of the thing we don't see, the thing that's the shadow. The, yeah, the, people are scared of the thing under the bed. No one could ever describe what it is. But they wouldn't dangle their foot over the edge and night. Uh... Well, we, we know. <laughs> for, you, for you guys, it's, it's uh, murderous koalas under your beds. Yeah, or the snakes or the spiders. Take your choice. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's plenty of Those things over there. Are really, that scary. We have two in our house, so. <laughs> I have a friend that uh, right. is from down, probably down around the, the east coast, but uh, they said that when they were younger, they had a flood, uh, and the worst thing about floods is the brown snakes start swimming around mm-hmm. everywhere, and that's what they said. The oh, worst brown thing snakes. is. They're nasty mongers too. They, there's not a friendly bone in those little snakes, <laughs> and they're big. So what I think would they you... do more than Taipans do, if I remember right. Yeah, I they're think... less poisonous, but they're they're just more aggressive. Yeah, I think they are uh, the brown snakes responsible for the most bites for, yeah, you, for Australia. Browns. Yeah, because the inland Taipan is pretty much away from people normally, isn't it? It isn't where people are. Yeah, it's in pretty isolated areas, and most people with bites never get to make it anywhere, so they don't get counted. I don't think. Wolf Creek style. Yeah. There's another horror movie. Wasn't there a horror movie called yeah, Wolf Creek? Drop Bears is the first in an Aussie horror series. Don't worry, we got Wolf Creek covered. Well, you're, you're, uh, what was it? Running away from a, a scary guy that lives in the desert. Yeah, pretty much. 
I've covered, there's, it narrows down. So there's, there's a little bit of story behind why Drop Bears and the series goes in the order it does. So Drop Bears is the Australian myth. The second one is a local myth to where I live now. And the third one is a myth based around where I was born, like where I am originally from. That's and great. yeah, they're all they're all based on real true stories and things like that that go around. I'm like the second one is called the Bunyip. And the Bunyip is one of my favorite uh, old Australian insults that people used to call each other is when you're ugly and an idiot, you're your Bunyip. <laughs> but up until just over a hundred years ago, they still thought the Bunyip was real. They were sending people out to try and find it because cattle went missing in these like water, wetlands and things like that. Yeah, they were positive there was something out there eating them. <laughs> Isn't there a lot of crocodiles out there? No, not this far south. Oh, right, okay. Too cold. You can only ride them so far down before they do. They're like tauntauns. <laughs> to get they to just... the third marker, they die. <laughs> they go, <laughs> and then fall yeah. over. And then you have to cut them open and sleep in them. <laughs> Right, uh, <laughs> next question. I think we got a bit off track there, but that was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun crocodile field track. <laughs> what is one piece of advice you would give to a new designer coming into the business? Mm, don't plan to be a millionaire. Um, the, don't think it won't be work. It's, it really is work. As much as I really enjoy what I do, um, there's lots of late hours, there's lots of failure, uh, there's lots of unexpected expenses, um, there's lots of things you won't know, um, but it's a business as well. Like You don't get to publish a game properly and get it onto retail shelves and do, do the thing that would make you know everybody have one on a shelf sort of game without the legwork. There is lots of it. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Lordy, the community is fantastic for help. Yes, it is. And yeah, you're you're right. It's, it's one of those things. And I've, it is hard work, but I will say, I mean, I love designing games, but I really start to enjoy the after as well. I've, I really started to enjoy, you know, dealing with, uh, yep, last minute graphic design like you're working on, um, dealing with manufacturers. I'm kind of enjoying that as well and getting quotes and seeing, you know, the prices of certain parts and, how it all lines up and it's I'm all... enjoying the product design element of it at the moment like we've just finished um designing the insert for the game and oh my god this thing's uh making game trays jealous uh I've had a lot of I hear helping me it's amazing um oh, so you're actually what a doing difference. it yourself are you you're not getting game trays or anybody to yep. do it you're designing it yourself no everything everything's designed um as I I guess I'm one of those different designers. I don't want to do what everyone else has done. I, I want to question, can I do it myself? And the answer is a lot of the time you can. <laughs> you really can do it yourself. And, and when it comes to that uh, that game tray that you're making for the game, is that is that going to be plastic molded? Yep. And how Aluminum much mold. did it cost you uh, to set it up? Uh, it can really depend on a few different things. For um, for a lot of people, you wouldn't need to do two. I need to do two because of the shape of my cangulus, but it's quite tall. Um, so it'll be a layered tray where most of you are doing the real standard sort of size game box that most people know. Um, you could get away with one layered tray, which would, would, would definitely cut some costs down in the fact that it's one tray, but it would be bigger as well. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 either way. Um, but my my game tray was the idea behind it wasn't just the storage of the game, but the functionality of using the tray as a component because it, it got paid for as a component, as an ex quite an expensive component. So I wasn't wanting something that you just chuck in the box and sort of forget. This will be something that wows you just like one of the wooden tokens with the screen printing or, you know, some of the dice or the, the screen printed bag or, you know, all those sort of things that you pull out as you get it open for the first time. I want the, the tray itself to give you almost that same sort of experience. So it forms into two layers. Um, the first layer, the top layer is the game functional tray. So you actually pull that out and slap it straight on the table and it's ready to go. 
It is fully loaded with all the stuff that you will need during the game. The bottom tray is all the stuff that you'll pick once and leave the rest of in the tray, like pick a character or the remaining characters back in the tray. The, those sort of things go back in the tray. Yep, that was the same as the one we did. I know you looked at our last Kickstarter there, and if you go down to where the Space Bazaar is, that was so we self-designed that as well, so it was a tray that came out and turned into a piece of the game in the middle of the table so that you could go yeah. and get, get the stuff you needed yet. Yeah, and it, like I said, it didn't actually work out too much. I can't remember the exact figures now, but the cost of it going through... So if we went through game trays, it was quite expensive, but obviously they've got oh, a... Horrendously yeah. so. Nothing, nothing against those guys, but God damn, is it expensive. Yes. I was talking to Dan, who designed Chai, and he did game trays for the original Chai. And my Lord, I, he nearly floored me when he told me how much it was because we're using the same manufacturer. So. No, because we, yeah, when we, it was the manufacturer that said, well, we can do it ourselves as well. And we were like, oh, really? And then the manufacturer told us how much it was for them to make a mold and to do the tray for us. And it was literally like 10% of the cost. And we were yeah. like, wow, that is, and that's why we decided, yeah, we'll design our own and do that ourselves. Yeah, and you did exactly what I love with a lot of the designers. You questioned it. You know, you could have gone to the manufacturer and the manufacturer could have gone, oh, no, it's the same price. It's 100% the same price. You know, that's just the way it is. There's no other option. But to be told, yeah, it's 10% of the price. No small designer can afford game trays, and nor should they be spending money on game trays, to be honest. Then you're not going to make or break your product. Um but explore other options. I mean, I was looking um, probably not with Rat Catcher, but maybe with Drop Bears, we're looking at even changing out a plastic tray to something a bit more environmentally friendly, like an eco foam or something. Um, just because I do want to try and start making a product that is a little bit more sustainable, a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, but it is something that requires a little bit of cost. So with Rat Catcher, I didn't really have the budget to, to fling around with experimentation with that. But now with a little bit, hopefully, of leftover cash out of this Kickstarter, I can reinvest it into innovating and hopefully setting a new cornerstone for maybe a more environmental approach to something that we regard as a must plastic item. Well, this has been brilliant, Matt. Thank you very much for coming and talking to me today. Pleasure. And I wish you the best with uh, getting Ratcatcher out to your backers.